Now, one thing I want to begin, or the way I want to begin this morning, rather, is, is you may not know this, but I'm going to tell you. And so now that I tell you, you will know. And at least you will have been told. The chief end of man is to glorify God. That means that the ultimate purpose of your life is to bring glory to God. Now, reality in our world today is that some people don't know this. Some people do know this. A reality that I think we have to understand and be willing to face and accept is that it's even common in our churches for folks to not know that the chief end or chief goal of their life is to glorify God. I have, this is totally like a detour and I hate to have to do this, but am I really loud? Yeah, okay, let me rephrase the question. Am I louder than normal? I feel really loud, but I'm just going to keep screaming, I guess. Sorry. Side note, Pastor Aaron and I laugh a lot. Of course, he preached last week, and so when we were driving home from vacation, I was listening to Pastor Aaron's sermon. And uh, we, we talk often about sometimes how awkward it is to listen to yourself. And, uh, but yet any preaching thing that you consult say it's good to listen to yourself sometimes because, you know, you can grow from that. You can learn from, from different things and nuances. And, and I am really intense. Like, I don't mean to just scream all the time. And lots of times I'll be up here preaching and I'm feeling like I'm just humming along, you know, and we're doing okay. And then I'll have to watch it for some reason or listen to part of something. I'm like... Man, I'm like, ah, and so, I don't know. I guess it works. <laughs> I don't know. The chief end of man is to glorify God. That's the, the ultimate reality of every human being's life. You were created for the purpose of bringing God glory. And we know this to be true, a number of passages in Scripture. One of them is Philippians chapter 2. You may be familiar with Philippians chapter 2. This is where we read about what we call the kenosis, where Jesus uh, took on flesh. Paul, writing to the church of Philippi, just talks about this reality of he, uh, though he was equal with God, he thought it not robbery to lay aside that equality with God and to take on uh, flesh And to be obedient to the will of the Father to the point of his death, even death on a cross. That's verse 8. And then in verse 9, Paul says this, Therefore, because he did those things, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's how Paul ends that section in Philippians 2. To the glory of God the Father. And this is a a common phrase that we see throughout the New Testament. We see it in really in a lot of ways in the Old Testament as well. You know, if if you're familiar with the book of Exodus, one of the phrases that I, I know I was guilty of, of kind of glossing over, and then a number of years ago I taught through some of Exodus, uh, and, and one of the things that just really you kind of kept going back to and you started to notice, hey, this is being repeated and this is being repeated, was that every time God would send Moses, and, and Moses would teach or he would instruct or he would call Pharaoh to let the people go, and, and Pharaoh would rebuff him, you would in some way, you would read this phrase where uh, Moses would speak on behalf of God and he would communicate, I'm going to do these signs and wonders so that the world will know that I am the Lord God. And, and the reality is, when you, as much as we think about the events of the Exodus, they're to the glory of God. It's not just that the world would know who God is, it's that the world would function understanding who He is in light of His glory. And so to the glory of the Father, every single individual will acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. And that's a sobering reality if we're honest. Because what we see Scripture unfold for us, you know, right right here in Philippians 2, is that every knee will bow at the name of Jesus and acknowledge Him as Lord to the glory of the Father. Every tongue will confess 
Now, we live in a world where not everybody knows Christ as Savior. And so what we understand Scripture is teaching to us is the reality that Christ will be acknowledged as Lord with the tongue and with the bowing of the knee either as Savior or as judge. And both of these are to the glory of the Father. You see, man with their lives will bring glory to God the Father. Whether you want to, whether you think you will, whether you care about God, any of those things, none of those things matter. At some point in your life, you will willingly acknowledge Jesus as Lord, bowing the knee, confessing with the tongue to the glory of the Father, or when you stand before him, you will be judged, acknowledging Jesus as such, also to the glory of the Father. The chief end of man is to glorify the Father, and it will happen. Now this chief end of glorifying the Father is a reality that is very clear in the life of Christ. And I want us together this morning to examine just a small portion of Jesus' prayer in John 17. But what we will unequivocally come away from John 17 understanding is that the primary goal of Jesus' life was that the Father would be glorified. Our passage here this morning is much more than just seeking the Father's glory exclusively. He literally, Jesus that is, did this throughout his life. So, so Jesus seeking the glory of the Father was not limited to this prayer in John 17. This literally was part of who Jesus was and what Jesus did all throughout the duration of his life. But this passage hits a little bit different. At least I would submit it should. Reformer Philip Melanchthon, he was a reformer right in the early stages of the Reformation, along with Martin Luther, he had this to say about the prayer of Jesus in John 17. There is no voice which has ever been heard, either in heaven or in earth, more exalted, more holy, more fruitful, more sublime than the prayer offered up by the Son of God himself. This hits a little bit different. I would submit to you that the prayer offered here by Jesus is such that it should be viewed as sweeter than honey and more pure than fine gold. And as we'll see through our text, Jesus knew his mission. He knew the task that the Father had given to him, and he was committed to it and to bringing the Father glory through the completion of that task. Now, again, as we've noted, John 17, it's a, it's a prayer of Jesus, and it seems to be a part of the prayer that's recorded for us in other Gospels as the prayer that was prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane by Jesus as he left his disciples and went to a further place into the Garden. And because that seems to be the case, although we don't know that definitively, but tracking a timeline, this is what we reasonably see and has been accepted Jesus has just finished teaching his disciples about the reality of his death, uh, about the reality of the things that were in hand. He started this in the upper room discourse we saw back beginning in John 13. And so now as Jesus is praying this prayer of being glorified, it's being prayed under the backdrop. Many of the disciples, we have to believe, could hear him. He was in the garden, they were in the garden, but the Bible tells us again, he went to a, a little bit deeper place in the garden, but he's praying all of these things within the earshot of at least some of the disciples, and he's praying about the Father being glorified. And immediately after the prayer of Jesus, the next thing Scripture records for us in John 18, and we'll look at this next week, is the arrest, the betrayal of Jesus. This prayer, and, and again, we know the disciples were there, they were a part of that. That's why it's very reasonable to believe that the disciples heard Jesus praying this prayer, that it breaks naturally up into three sections. The first five verses, which will be for our consideration this morning, are a prayer for, of Christ to be glorified by the Father to the glory of the Father. So Christ is praying for his own glorification 
understanding that his glorification results in the glorification of the Father. Secondly, in verses 11 through 19, Christ prays for the disciples who will be left behind following his glorification. And then the chapter finishes or the prayer finishes with Christ praying for the church that would result from the disciples carrying on the mission of glorifying the Father. And so I want us to look together at the first five verses of the prayer of Jesus in John 17. When Jesus had spoken these words, so Jesus is finished teaching his disciples. Again, we see in, in other, uh, other gospel accounts, Jesus is finished teaching, and now he's left them to pray, or to stay alert as he goes in to pray. So it says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted his eyes to heaven and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Let's pray together this morning. God, the chief end of our lives is to bring you glory. And it is my prayer this morning, God, that it would be our desire to bring you glory. A desire to bring you glory springs out of an understanding of who we are in light of who you are. It springs out of an understanding of what Jesus has accomplished through his life and through his ministry. It springs out of an understanding of knowing just how wretched we are. And yet, God, your ultimate plan was to sacrifice your son for the purpose of sinful man's redemption. And God, the greater we understand this, the more we grow in these realities the more we'll desire to glorify you with our lives. And help us, God, also to be spurned to action by the reality that every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. And some of these folks are going to do so not recognizing him as their Savior because they've trusted him in this life and pursued your glory, but, God, because they've denied Jesus. Because they've suppressed the truth of your word deep down in their hearts, we read in Romans chapter 1. And that in denial of Jesus and in suppression of truth, they will stand before Jesus and you will be glorified as they recognize him as their judge. God, the days are short. I think of even the words of Jesus here, the hour has come. God, we don't know when the hour will be for us. We don't know when the hour will be for this world that we live within. But God, if your word is true, and I pray desperately that we believe it is, then time is short, and people need to hear the truth of Scripture, and they need to be given an opportunity to, to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus as Savior. Help us to see today, God, that the desire of Jesus was to glorify you. And help us out of seeing that, God, to desire with our own lives to see you glorified. And we want to be careful to give you that glory, God, because you alone deserve it. In Jesus' name, amen. I want us together this morning, and we're going to do this very quickly, okay? Uh, a reality that I would said to Pastor Aaron probably three times this week is there's so much I have to leave here. I, we literally don't have time in a Sunday morning sermon session to unpack. Like, I joked this morning with the, the leadership team downstairs. I said, one of these days, I'm going to start developing a sermon series called Stuff We Had to Gloss Over. And it's just going to be all of the things that are really significant. And we could just, there are one or two specific verses that we could literally preach an entire sermon on and take all of our time examining together. But obviously, you guys don't want to be here till about 2 and so, uh, or longer, and so we have to leave some here, and I want you to understand that that's, it's kind of intentional just because of the restraints that we're up against, um, uh, 
But I say that also to say that, you know, when we're going to look at four observations. I say this all the time because I want to continue to remind you of this. Look, when we make four observations from the first five verses of John 17, I am not telling you that's all there is. Go home today, throughout this week. Reread John 17, 1 through 5. Think about some of the things that we've talked about or some of the things that you've heard. Um, be challenged by God's word to go beyond just hearing what you hear me say on a Sunday morning because there's so much more to be said. Um, so let's dive in. Observation number one. Jesus desires to bring the Father's glory. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son. Why? That the Son may glorify you. Jesus' ultimate desire was to bring the Father glory. And we see this right away again in verse 1, that the foundation of what Jesus would pray for himself, for his disciples, and for the church as a whole was rooted in the desire that Christ had for the Father's glory to shine forth. In all areas, in all aspect of this prayer that Jesus prays, his goal and desire is that the glory of the Father would shine forth. And notice the thrust of what is going to bring the Father the glory that Jesus desires him to receive. Jesus says, the hour has come. The time of the glorification of Jesus to the glory of the Father was now at hand. The ultimate purpose of the Father to reverse the curse and to offer atonement once and for all was to come through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And the hour had come for these things to take place. And it's important, I would submit, that we recognize a shift in what Jesus is saying. Because there was a time in the ministry of Jesus when his proclamation was not, my hour has come, or the hour, or the time has come. I think of John chapter 2 and uh, the, the, the wedding at Cana, the first of Jesus' miracles. Jesus' own mother comes to him and says, Rot of wine, and Jesus says, in so many words, I'm paraphrasing, what does that have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. It's not yet time for the Father to be glorified in this particular way. But now we see Jesus saying that the hour has come. Again, we've referenced this interaction with Jesus and his gardens and or Jesus and his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. And so even though there's, there, this shift is taking place, and we see it here in 17.1, in Mark 14.41, we see the same thing. When Jesus confronts his sleeping disciples, he tells them, wake up. The hour is at hand. My time has, has come. And I would submit to you this morning, it is a vital observation that the body of Jesus Christ make today, that Christ was consumed with glorifying the Father, even at the expense of himself. And there's no denying this, because Jesus is literally, when he prays, my hour has come, glorify your son that you may be glorified, you could literally say he's asking the Father to bring to completion the plan that culminates in what? His crucifixion, his death. Jesus is so consumed with bringing the Father glory in his life. He's literally saying, do what we've set out to do. Offer atonement through my death. And honestly, this morning I will submit to you that one of the greatest issues plaguing the church of Jesus Christ today is that it's full of people who are more concerned with their own glory than they are with God's. Can you imagine with me what a world would look like if we were more concerned with God's glory than our own? Consider with me, for example, prosperity preachers. And Pastor Aaron touched on this last week, the prosperity gospel. These, these people, they distort the word of God for what purpose? Their own advantages, their own gains, and ultimately their own what? 
glory. It's about themselves. What about the people who follow them to their detriment and discouragement when they realize that those they have been following have been seeking their own glory, not God's? This, this is very detrimental to folks. How about those who pursue their own glory through popularity, academics, athletics, and a whole number of other things at the expense of God's glory? And I would submit to you this morning, whether or not our greatest pursuit is our own glory or is God's, will be fueled by what is evidenced in our lives. How often do we sacrifice for the glory of God? How often do we sacrifice? If the people of God viewed the glory of God as their chief end, as we've noted, then I promise the world that we live in, the church that, that is around this world would look drastically different. You see, the world was altered by the sacrifice of Christ, and the world will continue to be altered by the sacrifice of God's people for his glory. I want you to understand something. It is not possible to bring the Father glory if you do not desire to do so. If you don't desire to see God glorified in your life, I'm going to let you in on something. You won't bring God glory with your life. And that just is practical advice, right? If we don't desire it, it's not going to happen. And so I just want to ask, do you desire to bring God glory with your life? Jesus not only desired to see the Father glorified, but he willingly subjected himself to the Father's will for the purpose of bringing glory to the Father. Observation number two, Jesus' subjection was to the glory of the Father. This is verses two and three. He says, since you have given him, him is a reference to himself, Jesus, authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given to him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ who you have sent. You see, Jesus willingly acknowledges that his authority to do the will of the Father was given to him by the Father and required his subjection to the Father in order to be carried out. We've noted the Father is glorified as sacrifices made for the redemption of mankind to reverse the curse, just as he promised to do in Genesis chapter 3. You see, being subjected to the Father is where Jesus finds the authority to give eternal life to those whom the Father has given to him. Jesus has been given authority that will come through his subjection to the will of his Father. He does not have the authority to give eternal life if he is not willingly subjected to the Father. Okay? And so this is integral to the glorification of the Father. Jesus willingly submits or uh, subjects or submits himself to the Father. And we must understand, subjection is not simply identification. Jesus did not simply identify as though he was sent by the Father. He did do that. But subjection was about living out or carrying out the plan of the Father no matter what that will was, no matter what that plan was, no matter what the cost of carrying out the will of the Father was. And I want you to understand something. The expense of our redemption to the glory of God was great. It was so great. And the reward of redemption that is our salvation, is amplified by the cost that it cost, or the price that it cost, to be a little more grammatically correct. If for no other reason we should treasure and value our salvation because it came at such a great cost to the Father and to the Son. Too many folks, too many folks today seek to identify merely with words that they belong to God. There is no earnest desire or subjection to God for his glory. It's merely an outward uh, verbal identification. 
Where would we be if Jesus would have been, nah, I'm not doing this. I'm out. When they mocked him and said, he says he's going to save the Jews. He can't even save himself. Let him get down off there. Then we will believe. Where would we be? Like practically, honestly, where would we be if Jesus got down off the cross of Calvary? You know where we would be? Dead in our sins. But we're not. Because the Son willingly subjected himself to the Father and operated underneath his authority. And the reward of the subjection of Jesus to his Father was that he had the authority to give eternal life to those whom would believe. Now that is some authority. Jesus has the authority to give eternal life. That's to say that those who have eternal life, that is to say they know the Father and the one whom the Father has sent. I want you to understand something this morning. Again, I would submit to you that far too many folks in the church today are operating under the reality or under the uh, assumption or idea that eternal life is in the future. Eternal life is something to be gained or gathered later on. But that's not what Jesus says here at all. Jesus doesn't say, since you have given me, him, authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all you have given to him, and this is eternal life, that you might someday know or realize. No, he doesn't say that at all. He says, this is eternal life that they know, present tense. Eternal life is now. It's the day you trust Jesus for your salvation is the day you begin to know eternal life. It's not a far off. It's not something we long and aspire for in the sense that we'll achieve it when we die. Eternal life is knowing the God of the Bible and the Son whom he sent to purchase our redemption. When the church lives as though their eternal life has already begun, they will, be, they will live motivated for and captivated by the glory of the Father. You see, when you live in light of something different, it changes things, right? So I want to ask some of the same questions for application. Have we subjected ourselves to the Word of God and what He has revealed in it? Because it's not possible to bring glory to the Father apart from our willful subjection to the Father and to the Son, to the glory of the Father. Have you, and if you have not, are you willing to grab a hold of eternal life, recognizing that it began the day you trusted Christ, if you have in fact trusted Christ? Eternal life, if you know Christ as your Savior, eternal life is now. It's not down the road. Yeah, there's a reality that we live out our eternal life in eternity, but it doesn't begin then. It's already began. You see, the Father is glorified when his, when, when, when his church subjects herself to him for his glory. Are you subjecting yourself to the Father for his glory? Third observation. The proof of the subjection to the Father lies in the obedience that, lives out, that was lived out by the Son. Jesus' obedience brings the Father glory. Verse 4, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. You see, Jesus accomplished that which the Father sent him to do, and this brings the Father glory. And while Jesus says that he has accomplished all that the Father sent him to do, it was clear and is to be understood that this would include what awaited him in just a few short hours. It's really as though Jesus is saying, I have lived the way that was necessary to live. I have been faithful to the will that you have given to me for my life to your glory that has enabled me to now be sacrificed to purchase redemption. I have accomplished what you sent me to do. You see, Jesus did not come merely to proclaim a kingdom of righteousness. It wasn't just about telling people that the kingdom of heaven is at hand and that, that kingdom is, is righteousness. 
That wasn't all Jesus did. He didn't proclaim, or he didn't only proclaim righteousness. He lived righteousness. He suffered and he died in righteousness. Why? So that he could be raised in righteousness. And this was all predicated upon him accomplishing what the Father had given him to do. And all of this could only be accomplished through the obedience of Jesus to his Father's will. And it started with his taking on of flesh. The same writer, John the Apostle, says in chapter 1 of this same gospel, verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's the reality here, is that a portion of Jesus accomplishing the task that the Father had given to him was that he would leave a heavenly abode that was free from any of the nonsense and the muck and the mire that has marred this world because of sin. And he would take on flesh and he would dwell amongst men being like men but uniquely qualified through his perfect faithful obedience to be sacrificed to redeem the very people who rejected him. We saw also, I've already referenced this, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves. I love this. Paul says to the church in Philippi, and by way of the church of Philippi, us today, have this mind amongst yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. So he says, if you are in Christ, let this be the way you think. He says, who, again referring to Christ, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You see, he was not only found in the form of a man as the full manifestation of the Father and all of his glory, as we saw in John 1.14, but he was subjected to the Father, and in his obedience, he laid down his life. And he laid down his life in the most brutal and gruesome of ways. It's significant that the Apostle Paul says there in the end of this passage in Philippians, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Like you could stop there and you could say, that's good enough. Jesus accomplished the task because he took on the form of a man, he took on flesh, and he was obedient, obedient unto the point of death. But Paul didn't stop there. Why? Because dying on a cross was significant. It was part of the plan and purpose that the Father had. And he was not only found, again, as this full manifestation of the Father in all of his glory, but in doing so, in taking on flesh, he suffered the most heinous of deaths. We will never understand, i just be honest with you this morning, we will never be able to quantify in our understanding and our thinking crucifixion at the hand of the Romans. What a brutal and gruesome, excruciating experience this would be for the individual who was crucified. And that was the plan before the foundations of the world for the son, and he knew it. He didn't learn of the plan when he came to earth. He knew the plan of the father, and he willingly subjected himself to it and then lived faithfully in obedience to it in order that it could come to fruition. Why? All to the glory of his father. Jesus could not bring glory to the father apart from obedience and neither can you and I today. Are you obedient in order to bring glory to the Father? And Jesus desires his subjection to the Father, his obedience to the Father, are ultimately about his glorification by which 
the Father is greatly glorified. And our fourth and final observation this morning is that Jesus' ultimate glorification brings the Father glory. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. And so Jesus' ultimate glorification to the glory of the Father is what? It's the restoration of himself back to his rightful place in the presence of the Father. You see, all of the observations, the first three observations we've made today, point to this final observation. That at the end of a life that is lived for the glory of the Father, the one who lived it themselves, will be glorified with and before the Father. When you live your life for the glory of God, you are glorified when you leave this life. This was a reality for Christ. His desires, his subjection, and his obedience to the Father would end in his glorification with the Father. Again, we've touched on when a person today understands the truths of the gospel and believes by faith, they receive eternal life. And that eternal life, as we've looked at it, culminates in glory. And this is a reality that this same author, John, would write about in one of his letters, 1 John. In 1 John 3, 2, he says this, Beloved, we are God's children now. Okay, eternity's already started. We're, we're in the family of God. And what will be has not yet appeared. But what we know, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Because we shall see him as he is. Now listen, we are not little gods. Okay, that's false theology. That's bad teaching. We're not going to be like Jesus in the sense that someday we get to be gods. But you know, one day, for those who live their lives for the glory of the Father, having trusted Christ for salvation, one day you will see Jesus in his glory. And you will be like him. You will see, you will stand before Jesus face to face in his ultimate glorification. And so while we're not little gods in that sense here on this earth and in this life, Scripture very clearly teaches that we are being conformed to the image of Christ as we live our lives following the example of Christ. Now I want you to understand something. Being conformed to the image of Christ looks a lot like living our lives to the glory of the Father. We must desire to do so. We must be willing to subject ourselves to what the Word of God teaches, and we must faithfully obey it. God is at work. Paul would tell the church at Philippi that he will bring to completion the work that he started in the day of Christ Jesus. Your salvation is a work that God began And he is faithful to continue that work until you are conformed to the image of his son, which is the day of the completion, when you see Jesus and you are like him. We're being conformed as we live to the glory of the Father. There's an old story I want to finish with this morning. In a book called The Great Stone Face, Nathaniel Hawthorne tells of a boy who lived in a village below a mountain. And on the mountain was an image of a great stone face looking solemnly down upon the people. A legend claimed that someday someone would come to that village who looked just like the great stone face and he would do wonderful things for the village and would be the means of great blessing. The story so gripped the young boy that he would spend hour after hour looking at the great stone face and thinking about the one who was coming. Years passed. And the promised one did not come. The boy became a young man, and he kept contemplating the majestic beauty of that great stone face. By and by, his youth passed into middle age, came on. The man still could not get the legend out of his mind. Finally, he reached old age. And one day, as he was walking through the village, someone looked at him and exclaimed, He has come, the one who is like the great stone face. The old man had become like the object he had contemplated. And so it is with us. You want to be like Jesus? You want to be like Jesus to the glory of the Father? Then you must contemplate Jesus. You must contemplate the glory of the Father. There's no other way. You can't be, you cannot be transformed to be like Jesus without Jesus. 
And this, to me, goes all the way back to where we started with a misunderstanding about ultimately what the purpose of our lives is. Without an understanding that if we're going to glorify the Father, if we're going to be like Jesus, then we must have a desire to do so. You want to be like the, or you want to glorify the Father? You got to want to. You want to be like Jesus? You got to want to. And Jesus has given us the example to follow of how to glorify the Father. And in our context, while doing so, become like Jesus. Desire him. Do we desire Jesus? The Father is glorified when those who claim to belong to him are conformed to the image of his Son. And ultimately, they'll be united with him in glory. You see, the life of Jesus was all about the glory of the Father, and our lives are no less to be about the Father's glory. Do we desire the Father's glory? Are we subjecting ourselves to the Father for his glory? Are we obedient for the Father's glory? Are we living faithfully awaiting our ultimate glorification to the glory of the Father? May our hearts cry be, glorify us so that we may glorify you. Let's pray. Father, we have such a tremendous privilege to live our lives for your glory. It pains me, God, because I believe so often the church functions in light of something else, whatever it is. We, we, we forsake that privilege and that opportunity to live for your glory. But God, stir our hearts today. Help us to be reminded that this is our chief end, that we would live for your glory. God, that we would desire you and your glory, that we would desire your son, that we would willingly subject ourselves, God, to you and to your word and, and, and to uh, just to the authority that you are and you have and you've given to Jesus. God, that we would be obedient. God, help us to, to, to be challenged today. Obedience is not obedience when things are easy. It's not hard to be obedient when <clears throat> it's simple or when there's not great expense. It wasn't hard for Jesus to be obedient when he was performing miracles and turning water into wine and multiplying bread and fish. Jesus' willingness to be obedient is, is manifest as he prayed in the garden of Gethsemane and literally sweated drops of blood earnestly seeking, God, that if there be any way that, that, that you could carry out this plan and you could fulfill these purposes without him absorbing your wrath, may it be. But he said at the end of that prayer, and we're familiar with it, but not our glory, yours. Not our will, yours. We must look to the times when Jesus was obedient and it was tough and see that that's the example that God you're calling us to follow. And God, may we live our lives understanding, not that we're in a hurry to go, not that we're in a hurry to be glorified, not living, uh, we just pray to you, help us, God, to not live as though the now doesn't matter. Eternal life has begun if we're in Christ. And so help us to live in light of that. Help us to pursue your glory and our conforming to the image of your Son, throughout our time, however long it may be on this earth. And God, I want to pray also this morning just for, for maybe the one today who's been challenged about this reality of the purpose of their life and that it's ultimately about your glory. And God, I pray that you would just stir those hearts, that you would challenge those hearts, God, that you would, that you would break those hearts to, to see truth for what it is. God, that your plan was perfect, that your love is great, and that redemption is possible in Jesus. And only through our redemption through Jesus can we truly bring you glory in this life. And so, Father, I pray this morning that you would accomplish your tasks and that you would accomplish your purposes, God, and that you would be glorified. Father, I'm thankful today for your goodness. 
I'm thankful today for the faithfulness of your son to willingly be subjected to your will and to be faithfully obedient to carry it out. God, may we seek your glory so that you could work through our lives so that we could produce more of your glory. Work in us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.